Hello and welcome back to another edition of GNET TV's In-Depth Series. I'm Andrew McKeever, the news director here at GNET TV's News Project. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. Today we're going to talk a little bit about a great event that took place almost exactly 50 years ago that uh, many of you either remember or certainly have heard about. And that, of course, is the Woodstock Music and Arts Fair that took place in, uh, uh, in Wallkill, New York uh, on August 15th through August 18th, 1969. Hard to believe that 50 years have gone by since that uh, amazing event. And with us today to talk a little bit about that, to recapture some of that magic and reminisce and uh, sort of try and parse out what the meaning of it all was, is uh, Steve Schlichel, who is a friend of ours from GNAT, uh, and also Theo Tolcott, another one of our colleagues here. And uh, gentlemen, thanks for uh, being here with us today. Thanks for having us today. To be here. Well, yeah. Um, so yeah, Woodstock. Uh, 50 years ago, 400,000 people jammed into a natural amphitheater there and Max Jasgar's farm and heard from some 30-odd different bands that kind of, uh, by some miracle or another, managed to get there and actually perform. The whole thing, of course, is, as we now know from the movie and from several books that have come out since then, was a kind of a, you know, haphazard sort of thing. Uh, you know, they didn't have a permit for the event a month before the event took place. Uh, we're expecting 200,000 people, not 400, and then not uh, counting the other 400,000 people that were probably stuck out on the New York State Thruway or somewhere or couldn't get there in the first place. So, uh, Steve, uh, get us started here. I, I was just thinking, tell us, how did you get, what was your story? How did you get to Woodstock and, and a little bit about what happened? Well, uh, somehow I ran into a bunch of friends who were driving there. This was on a Friday. And we had a station wagon full of people, uh, an odd group, people I went to high school with. Uh, I was just barely 16 and a half at the time. And uh, for some reason, my parents didn't give me any grief. So I packed up a sleeping bag, some food, and got into this car and started driving toward, I thought it was Bethel, where, where the place was off Route 17 in New York. So I was a suburban, middle-class uh, person of uh, some sort of privilege at that point. And my parents, uh, I don't know if they had their blessing, but uh, we got into the car and got within 10, 15 miles of the festival and couldn't drive anymore. So we all got out of the car and started hiking through the night, Friday night, and by daybreak, or maybe slightly before daybreak, we got to the festival, which uh, there was no music happening at that moment, and it was this giant field, a sea of people, and it was a mystery to us, and we kind of secured a spot, the group I was with, and waited for the day's festivities to happen. One of mm -hmm. the first things that did happen on that Saturday was a rainstorm, <laughs> All right. and um, that's what brought me there. Didn't know what to expect, and uh, didn't know that it was going to be the life changer that it was. Right, right. Yeah. Well, that that's kind of similar uh, to my story. I uh, I remember reading uh, in the Village Voice, which was an underground newspaper at the time, and right. uh, now sadly uh, gone away. Um, seeing an ad for it and seeing the list of bands that were going to be yeah. performing and uh, I was a big fan of Creedence Clearwater Revival at the time yeah. and I saw they were on the on the list and so my decision was made instantaneously I had to I had to go so I went down with uh, three other guys from Bennington we drove down the throughway you know it's amazing I, I, I've heard so many stories like yours where you know you got to the general area the traffic was so dense you couldn't park at the at the parking lot, we kind of just drove right in. We got there on uh, Friday afternoon. Um, we were heading south rather than north coming right. out from the city, so maybe that made a difference. But uh, I remember um, we pulled in uh, at a parking area, kind of got out of the car and started walking up the road there to where the concert site was. And uh, the first thing I remember, I remember having my tickets, you know, which, which I still have, of course, by the way, $6 a day for I think that's about, probably would have translated to about $50 a day now, but Easily. still a bit of a bargain. Getting up to the, the, to the gate and being told, well, it's a free concert. And I was like really annoyed because, wait a minute, I spent $12 for these tickets, <laughs> which at the time was like a lot of money at the time. Um, 
And uh, then we, <clears throat> we just sort of uh, wound up way at the back end of the, of the amphitheater uh, that Friday, but by gradually worked our way down uh, towards, sort of towards the front of the stage. But uh, yeah, I, I, I always remember that just the sea of people. Yeah. It's just uh, more, more folks there than I think I'd ever seen before or since, right? Uh, just At one time, amazing. yeah, in person. So Theo, you had the uh, misfortune of being born too late to be able to get to uh, this event, although you were probably there in spirit in one way or another. For sure. Um, but I'm, I'm curious to hear from you what, uh, when folks of your generation, you know, talk about Woodstock, is it one of these things where I was like, oh my God, you know, there go the baby boomers again talking about Woodstock and waxing nostalgic about this event? Or is it the kind of thing where you look at it and go, hmm, interesting. Uh, it was a, clearly a major historical, cultural moment in our, in our, in our history. And I mean, what, what do you think has been its legacy, I guess, is the way to... Um, well, there's like eight questions there. I'll, uh, I'll say, um, but I was born in 1970. I'll be 50 in September, so it's a, it sort of is oddly like synchronous with my own history. Um, but it always loomed large over my generation. Um, the culture, I, like I'm a musician, so I look to the music of Jimi Hendrix and uh, the Grateful Dead and that whole era being it's like a high point uh, of awesome music. Uh, so. We were always a little bit jealous that we missed it, you know, and um, and so uh, you know this current year feels a little bit like the '60s feel, and it's kind of contentious and political. And the art is pretty good now, and there are a lot of mass gatherings that are happening. So, um, but um, I I study yoga, and I I want to point out that Swami Satchitananda gave the opening benediction, which you can find on YouTube, and it's very beautiful. He really he said. The, Amer the American young people are waking up, and that if they continue to do so, maybe they'd wake up the whole world. Um, he, he, the whole sort of peace, love, and world peace energy of the '60s is precious and needs to be protected. That energy is um, really a way forward for the human race still. Um, and you know, some of what I think is most inspiring is like sort of the talk about the age of Aquarius, this prophetic mind of like another time that's possible. Um, We've been trapped in a war culture, and uh, I'm still hopeful the human race will get it together and go back to the garden. <laughs> well, um, I often find myself wondering if something like, like that could happen today. You know, uh, I mean, I know we've had big concerts and festivals and weekend-long events where probably a, a similar number of people probably showed up. but. Um, that kind of improvisational uh, situation that the organizers of the event found themselves in, where you know who was going to be performing on the stage was kind of being decided in the spur of the moment. Uh, who was there, like Richie Havens, for instance, who launched the uh, was the first artist to appear. He wasn't supposed to be the first artist on that lineup. He, he was there, and they were waiting for somebody else to get there. So since everybody was kind of getting restless at that point, on went Richie Havens. And, uh, and of course, that, uh, that song that he played, uh, uh, Freedom, uh, was kind of one that he made up almost right on the spot. Hmm. Yeah. But uh, I don't know. It just seems like that, that sort of, you know, Having something like that be successful, where no, like nobody would get hurt, or there wouldn't be violence of some sort, or or a lot of the, you know just uh, you know people kind of pushing and shoving, uh, it's hard to imagine. Well, it, you can't plan spontaneity, and to wish that again. Um, apparently, the present concert that's happening next weekend or whenever it is, as of this morning, I hear it's a free concert. So there, all the plans and all whoever was planning to make money, uh, that could be out the window. I, to me, that's a good thing to, for people to share. And um, one of the things I found there as a young person was uh, nothing but sharing. Um, the food vendors, soon ran out of food because there were many more people there than they had, they had planned. And me, myself and at least another one of my friend, the friends of ours went into what we called the woods and wound up eating a meal served by the hog farm. Wavy gravy, yeah, you yeah, Romney's people. Right, 
of some grain and currants and whatever. No charge. They were feeding. The people were lined up, and there seemed to be everybody just giving freely. And um, the the uh, people that had instituted this concert just shrugged their shoulders, and now it's a free concert. They didn't seem to care. I don't know how many of the bands, if any, actually got paid, but. Um, there was a whole paradigm of cooperation rather than competition there that I have I've seldom seen ever, since then. Mm -hmm. Now, Steve, you brought in a piece of art here that we have right behind you. Uh, <laughs> tell us a little bit about what, what is this supposed to mean okay, here? Okay, so um, coming back from Woodstock, I believe that fall I was a junior in high school and got very interested in counterculture politics, the Yippies, Abby Hoffman, Jerry Rubin, et cetera. And Abby had written a book about that time called The Woodstock Nation. Right, and I right. believe the cover of the book was a fist <laughs> on it, a resistance. And I didn't feel that it was a violent fist. It was a symbol of resistance like the Omega. And so for a social studies project, I don't know if they do social studies anymore <laughs> in school, but my social studies teacher, we all had to do a project for the year. And I decided I was going to do a painting. So I took the fist and stylized it and made this painting. And I was kind of upset I only got a B on the project, but it, <laughs> <laughs> it, it didn't matter. But um, that's how somewhat I was influenced by what I saw there. I was radicalized. I, was, I saw that there was another paradigm than going to work in a suit and tie, which I have done later in my, my life after that. But seeing that that wasn't the only thing going on and um, that resistance and questioning authority was a good thing and necessary. Um, right now we're going th through a regression and that's, that's being put down and there are all sorts of agent provocateurs to try to ruin anybody trying to descend. That's a whole other subject for a whole other show, but um, Back then, um, I can't say we were naive. We were more idealistic and felt we could make change, and we did. I mean, the war in Vietnam was soon, not soon ended, but uh, we were working towards it. And uh, that's what that painting, to me, represented. The, the Art Center, Southern Vermont Art Center, did a, a retrospective on Woodstock pictures a number of years ago, maybe 10 years ago, and I was fortunate enough to have that put in there along with the hash pipe that I bought when I was in the woods there back right. 50 years ago now. It was 40 years ago. So it, it's meaningful to me, and it's lasted. The, the lessons and my desire to still live in a cooperative world rather than one that's competitive all the time and based on uh, uh, re remuneration for everything you do. Yeah, well, uh, like mm -hmm. yourself, it was certainly a, a life-altering moment for me too. I was I was 18 at the time. I just finished high school. Was about to go on to college, and uh, I guess I'd be by that point I'd become fairly <clears throat> sort of radicalized by the politics of the time. And certainly, 1968 was a very tumultuous year with. Uh, uh, the assassinations of Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy and Kent State. Uh, Kent State. Well, Kent State was 1970. Uh, was it? Yeah, a year after it, the uh, you know, election of uh, uh, Richard Nixon, uh, and of course, hanging over everything, the war and um, uh, the civil rights movements, all the all the domestic upheavals at the time. I remember thinking of the, those three days as like sort of a break. It was like uh, you, know, you, you finally got a weekend off from all of that, and uh, it was just sort of uh, really, really pleasant to kind of just sort of have music to listen to and, and other things to do or think about than, uh, than all the politics of the time. So um, one of my, my teachers, uh, Joseph Campbell, talked about Woodstock as uh, the emergence of the divine feminine. 
uh, in the collective con unconscious of the society. So like, at the same time they're having all this war and st struggle and strife, this uh, very beautiful side of the human uh, being arises uh, when the men start growing their hair long and talking about peace and justice and um, it was sort of like an antidote and, it, and, and in some ways the beauty of the kids and the music was like an antidote to all the ugliness of the war. So mm -hmm. I'm very exactly. So what do we know about the uh, plans for a, a 50th anniversary concert because it seems like there's a lot of confusion, a lot of I don't know if it's incorrect information or misinformation going out there, but is the latest uh, version going to be a concert held down near Washington, D.C.? Correct, yes. Meriwether Post Pavilion, August 16th to the 18th, they're doing something. Um, it's going to apparently benefit headcount and climate justice groups, so it looks positive. Um, the Dead & Company pulled out. Uh, I, I like the original. They struggled to find a venue. Um, <clears throat> for a while, it was going to be up at uh, Watkins Glen, but mm -hmm. I think they lost their permit. So, and yeah, I know at one point they were going to try and have it at the original site or, or right. somewhere in that area. There is an event at uh, Yasker's Farm, and there's also an event at the Bethel Woods Center. Uh, but you can't even get, get tickets, and they won't let you drive there unless you have a ticket. So, you're <laughs> Times have changed. Either you have huh? to have a ticket, or <laughs> but you probably, if you went, you probably get in. So yeah. who knows? I thought I could bring my original tickets and hand them I over. I still and say, could. Hey, <laughs> How about that? So, uh, Steve, any favorite moments that occurred to you while, while we were there? Or any bands that you heard that you really liked that you hadn't been aware of before? Or what well, were the highlights of it for you? Okay. Well, one of the big <clears throat> highlights was Saturday afternoon. It, it kind of started slowly with the music, and then Santana came on. To, up to that point, we didn't even hadn't known Santana. Yeah. They came on and started, and the whole place woke up. I yep. mean, it was like, who are these guys? Boom, yep. boom, 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 with the congas, and it woke the whole place up. They rocked. They were. It was a tremendous concert. You can. You can see the Soul Sacrifice, which was one of the uh, the big hits later on from the Santana's album, uh, on YouTube right now. And these guys were so young. I think Carlos was 19 at the time. The drummer Mike Shreve was 15 or 16, and they basically changed a sleepy little place and with all those people there was, you know, people were just doing their thing everybody sat up at attention that was a highlight to me the second highlight was uh, my, my best friend and I walked down to the front of the stage for Sly Sly and the Family Stone and I'll tell you a story it's, a, it's just amazing so we walked down Sly plays I want to get you higher mm -hmm. all the all his, all his hits and we turn around to go back to our people, to this sea of people, <laughs> just this a massive sea of people. And we just start walking and walking and walking. And all of a sudden, we stop, because we don't know where we're going in a sea of people. And after about two minutes of just standing there, we hear, will you guys sit down? Well, we had made it back, <laughs> unbeknownst to us, to our group. And that's somehow why we didn't know where to go next. The, we, the vibes brought us back. Right. And sure enough, we were at our group. And uh, that's a great story. And then the third thing was seeing Jimmy uh, Sunday, or it might have been Monday morning. Monday morning, morning. yeah. And um, it's funny, because at that point, we were just so exhausted and played out. It, it wasn't that big a deal to see him. I had seen him the year before. Uh, with the experience at, at Westchester County Center in, in suburban New York, one of the first concerts I had ever been to in my life, and uh, so uh, it was it was anticlimactic. So he was with a whole new band that wasn't Band of Gypsies yet, um, and after that, I think we the, another friend of mine wound up hitchhiking home because we had lost our ride, and, uh, <laughs> and at that point, it was it, physical and mental exhaustion had. had uh, yeah. So the, musically, those are the three things I remember. A lot of the bands were, were great, um, 
And you have your favorites, but those are the three things that stand out that I can remember for sure. Well, I definitely echo what you said about Santana. I mean, I remember uh, very clearly kind of sitting there and, you know, a couple of groups coming on and, and I was just kind of, you know, going uh -huh. with the flow. And then I had never heard of them either. I was totally unfamiliar with their music. And they just were electrifying. Oh I mean, God, I yeah. never really heard anything like that. And they, yeah, like you said, woke up the audience. So that's certainly one. Uh, I mentioned that I went down there, made Lucy Credence and John Fogarty. And, yeah. uh, of course, they were, they were uh, I really enjoyed their show. I remember, and I can't remember now why I did this, but me and my, one of my friends I was with, we left, just a slide in the family stone where we were about to come on, we went out and left, left the immediate arena and went back to the car, I guess, to get something. Mm -hmm. We were parked, and I remember walking down and hearing Sly come on and going, whoa, <laughs> that's pretty good. We should be back there. But by the time we got back, they yeah. were done. And then my last <clears throat> recollection that really stands out is uh, about 6 o'clock on, I guess, Sunday morning when the Jefferson Airplane finally came on. Yeah. It, was, it finally worked out way down to the very front. And it's been one of the things that's always bothered me about Woodstock is that I never saw a picture of myself in any of the <laughs> gazillion photos that have been taken of it, right? And I thought, okay, somewhere there's a picture of the airplane playing and they're looking into the, the front row of the, of the crowd. I'll be there. But anyway, uh, that was pretty neat. And then we left, we left right after that. We didn't stay for Hendrix, which was, of course, a monumental mistake, <laughs> but who knew? I mean, I figured, well, they'll have another one of these events next year, right? You know, this is just the first time for all of this stuff. And... Uh, It'll all be back. Well, I remember uh, Grace Slick saying, morning maniac music. Right, right. And, um, yeah, and at that point, the, the elevation of the, uh, of the crowd's psyche was like, it was way, it was about eight miles high at that point, and uh, the bands included. It was, it was quite something to have all those people on, on a level of cosmic bliss, as you, as I would call it at this point. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I mean, there have been a few attempts to have, uh, you know, uh, reunion events. There was one in 1989 and another one in 94, the 25th anniversary. I think, uh, I think there was even one uh, uh, that occurred to, in 2009. Interestingly, uh, one of the things I, I, had, I had almost forgotten about until I kind of went back through some, some old records, I had a chance to do an interview with Michael Lang, who was the mm -hmm, sure. uh, one of the organizers uh, right. of the festival when he came to uh, Manchester in 2009 to promote a book he'd written about about it. And it was time to coincide, I guess, with the 40th anniversary. And we did a telephone interview with him and uh, wrote up a little piece that appeared in the journal. And it was kind of interesting to talk to him about how he how he uh, came up with the idea of it. Uh, he had been a concert promoter down in Miami, Florida, uh, and, and producing shows down there came back up north in 68 and wanted to kind of do something on a larger scale, thinking 200,000 people maybe, and got, got together with some promoters. But uh, I guess the original, uh, one of the original inspirations was he, he settled in Woodstock, the town of Woodstock, New York. And uh, I guess um, for a while they had uh, these sort of outdoor concerts called Sound Outs. Uh, mm -hmm. And they would be, you know, musicians from around the area. And, of course, there were a lot of famous musicians who hung out in Woodstock. Bob Dylan, the band, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, among them. Yeah. Um, and we watched the, you know, the, the fun people were having at these outdoor concerts in Woodstock and thought, ah, let's scale mm -hmm. this up. And, uh, of course, the rest is history. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's quite interesting to, uh, to hear, uh, hear about it because it sounded like it was the whole thing was just like one... Of trying to avoid disaster at every turn, you know, with getting the bands there. They had to fly them by helicopter and and, and everything. It just it sounded crazy. I just can't imagine something like that going on now, but uh, but maybe it would. Well, um, so to make a link, um, so last summer the national the rainbow gathering happened in the national forest up here. And um, right. that operates on a very similar, the hippie mind of like the collective feeding and uh, working together in the woods. And in the way you described where people were just helping each other out. Um, that was, I think, that's a very beautiful culture and it exists in many places still. Um, and it's sort of been beaten out of the society, but I think that's a very <laughs> natural way for us to be. Which is why I think Woodstock really set a, hit a nerve, a cultural little nerve for people because it felt very familiar to them. It's like, this is something we recognize from another era, another time. 
um, where maybe, you know, people, this isn't a golden age we live in. I mean, we live in a dark age. You know, the Hindus call it Kali Yuga. I mean, you might not, you know, Donald Trump's the president. It's, this is not a time of enlightenment. The Dalai Lama is not our king, you know. So what I'm saying is, like, maybe in other eras, more enlightened eras, in the way, distant past or the future, inshallah. Um, but I guess my point is, um, humans can be better with each other and we can have higher values and like Swami Satchitananda when he kicked off at the festival invite you know he said very set a very high tone for um, the event and then let's not forget the psychedelic drugs which um, have their place in you know liberating the human mind um, one interesting um, development is that um, you know, there's a third psychedelic renaissance going on right now with people like Michael Pollan writing a book called uh, About It um, and a lot of good research going on with stuff like MDMA-assisted psychotherapy and uh, people pe treating people with PTSD uh, with psychedelics in order to help them, like, overcome their traumas. Um, so what they're finding is that the psychedelics actually help your brain develop new brain chemistry. So the cannabis is a cure for... Uh, like good old weed or cannabis is a cure for Alzheimer's because it, it actually generates new neural cells. Um, so a lot of what these, the, you know, the culture had just sort of adopted has been uh, proven uh, useful by science, which is an interesting thing, even if it has been made war against by the state for 50 years. And, uh, and that's sort of like a little bit of the Woodstock history too, is that this was definitely the, the culture that was like suppressed, that the state did not want because these were the kids who didn't want to go off to war. Um, I think Nixon pretty saw clearly that the, the people causing him trouble in the protests were the, the psychedelic people, so they made war on the psychedelics in order to make war on the left, and uh, that's more or less what the history is. Unfortunately, the reason a lot of these are making comebacks now or is, is that um, people found out how to make money from it. From from what? From d d selling marijuana-based uh, cures, and so now you can see people like uh, the former Speaker of the House uh, is behind it, and people are investing in it, and oh, yeah. there's there's a whole culture, Wall Street culture, that are are betting on it to take effect. And right. So, right. not that it's a bad thing, but that's. It might explain why a lot of it's coming back. It, it has become profitable, and John Boehner is invested in <laughs> hemp. Who'd have thought? Huh? So yeah, the GOP is getting aboard finally. Well, Fifty years later, yeah. finally. So did our founding Thanks, fathers. Thanks, Richard Nixon. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, one of the things I've always been on my bucket list for a long time is to go back there to the actual site, but I haven't made it yet. I thought, you know, at some point, uh, I remember thinking a couple of months ago that, ah, this is the opp opportune moment, but. Not looking good right now, but uh, we'll get there. There's a plaque. Yeah. Yes, I, I know that. I, and there's some kind of a, a there's some kind of a foreign venue there, yeah, I think. I I believe. There's some kind of a you, museum I, or something. I don't know. You can go back again. I mean, yeah. yeah. No, it wouldn't <laughs> so, be the same. There is a museum, sure. and there's there's yeah. a Bethel yeah. Woods. Right. Right. So I think the Yasgers Farm is the Bethel Woods place. Right. Yeah. Oh well, well. Uh, so much for our trip down memory lane. Uh, I want to thank Steve, Theo, and all of you for being with us today. Um, hope you've enjoyed the show and uh, our, our little uh, indulgence in memories of uh, the good old days. And um, we'll see you again the next time. Have a great day. <laughs>